community members and partners, and many dignitaries that have shown up today. I want to especially thank uh, the governor for showing up on the last day of the session. I was very honored and impressed. Thank you so much for being here. If you take the tour that we're going to be offering after, you will see historic photos of the Neighborhood House Board of Trustees meeting with the legislature back in like 1930. So it's a very cool photo. Check it out. And on the slideshow going, um, we have several photos of past governors and first ladies pouring high tea at some of the fundraisers of Neighborhood House in the past. We have Governor Ramsden up there, so take a look at that. Um, and then most currently, First Lady Abby Fox kicked off her show up youth initiative here at Neighborhood House, which was Thank you, Jennifer, for that kind of introduction, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be with you today. I'm so excited. You get to see me on my second favorite day of the legislative session. <laughs> this is the last day. Tomorrow is my favorite day. And uh, I was only supposed to be here for a couple minutes to give an introduction, and then I was supposed to hope. But things are going so well right now that, uh, that I'm going to stay and, uh, and watch the panel. So hopefully I'll be able to be with you uh, for, for a little while. We love this place. It is one of our favorite places in, in the entire state. And, and so like I wish more people got to come see the, the miracles that are happening here every day. And that history, as was mentioned, is, is foundational. I, I, had a, I had a professor once who said, uh, he said, you know, in, um, in, in, in the UK, 100 miles is a long ways. And in Utah, 100 years is a long time. <laughs> uh, obviously, the, the opposite is true, right, in, in those places. So, so anything that's been, uh, that's been an institution for more than 100 years is, is a really big deal. Now, this is what we should be doing, public-private partnerships, uh, everybody working together to help those in need uh, and, and to help hopeful generations as well. We, um, we're obviously focused on our kids, we should be focused on our kids, and that's one of the things I'm pushing really hard on the legislature is to remember to focus on our kids, make sure we have the funding for, for our kids and for education. That's how you get that start in life. That's how we make sure that, that everyone truly is opportunities that you don't start start off on second base or not even in the ballpark, right? Um, that, that everybody gets those opportunities to come here as well. Maybe maybe learning English, maybe maybe having other opportunities and seeing um, again seeing that sense of community and that sense of connection. It really is the best of our state. Look, there are lots of problems in our country. There are lots of problems in our state. Lots of things that the legislature gets right. Lots of things that the legislature gets wrong. Things that I do right, things that I do wrong. But I'm here to tell you that there are so many good things happening, and we need to look for the good in our communities. And this is one of those amazing things. And so I'm grateful to all of you who have dedicated your time, your passion, and your energy, and your money as well um, to making this place a success. We need more of this, not less of it. Um, and, uh, and I'm very excited for the future. So congratulations for all of you. Looking forward to hearing from our distinguished panelists. And uh, looking forward to an amazing 130 year celebration. I can't wait to see what the next 130 is like. Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, my team is here and we engage with neighborhood house with dollars each year um, from CDBG funds that come through the city to ACE grants, that's our arts, culture, and uh, education events programming. And we're going to keep looking for ways that we can amplify, as you said, grow the programs and the offerings and the welcoming nature of this incredible place. And I'll just mention, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, the opportunities that Neighborhood House developed and created during the pandemic, especially, I think, helped to explode how critical an operation, a community, this is. And uh, that has in no way diminished since the pandemic to whatever conclusion that it's at. It's only grown. And as we want to grow families in Salt Lake City, we need neighborhood house to keep growing right alongside us. There's so much good work. You know, when I came over from the I'm like, I can work here, and I know my kids are in a safe place. You know, I don't have to worry about where they are, what they're doing. You know, they're learning, they're growing. So, um, yeah, it's a wonderful place. You know? uh, and it's also providing me some opportunities communities um, think that they are. I see, you know, a lot of a lot of what we're seeing is the lack of community. And so I think neighborhood house is actually going to be more important than ever in the future. Uh, we need uh, we need we need this sense of community. We need to come together. So I, I see it growing, building, making sure that that it can be a part of the solution of building all communities. I think the model is absolutely critical to going forward in the future. I know I can't do that. 
and, and uh, they were making, the, the adults were making pies. You know, pre-made crust, and they were making pudding to fill in the pies and the green, and it, they were active and fun, having fun, and then they got to take the pies home. And it was so much fun to see them say that they succeeded in something, and, and it, was, it was great to see them. So in 1978, uh, we added the adult daycare services. And at that time, the board, all women board, by the way, still all women board, was very forward thinking and innovative. And what they saw is these hardworking families had loved ones at home that they were caring for, but also trying to make ends meet. Similar experience of the children, of the families with the children that they were having. And so at that time, the board looked at their mission and realized this is something that fit into their mission. And so they started to implement those services. And interestingly enough, um, at that time, adult services were just barely being implemented into the nation. So uh, lead, leader in the community for starting you know, this wonderful impact. So I was sitting at the end of the house really exemplifying the legacy we have here in Utah that this, the women who shape the state are not always visible, they don't always represent or see in meetings, but the people who are the problem solvers are the people who are the ones that are, are the women. And so we'll just start with that. But anything bigger than others who started that first kindergarten association in 1994, they saw those same needs that are really the critical needs today for families to be able to have quality childcare, for kids to get a basic sort of education, and for mothers and working parents to have job skills training and then also to train teachers so they had quality care and education for kids. It really was a neighborhood house. It really it? was. So when they opened up, they would be things like exactly today, they're, ho they're hosting childcare, they're having classes for immigrant mothers to be able to get better jobs. They're hosting training classes to make sure that those kindergarten teachers are trained in order to get quality care for kids. That the community not only still needs the same things that you're organizing right here every day, but we need it even more because as our, our governor often says, the access to the American dream really hinges on home ownership. And even attaining affordable rental housing is a incredible challenge for people all over the state of Utah right now. Really grateful for the government's leadership, um, especially in this late legislative session, but in the last three, four years of bringing more affordable housing dollars to the table in a big way. In the meantime, Salt Lake City has become mostly renter, and we have more households with dogs than with children. This has been decades in the making. And the affordability of housing with the access to high quality, affordable childcare are key weak links, not just in our economy, but in the stability of our neighborhoods and our communities. Fighting e scale, the wraparound services, that is something that, if replicated, could really make an, a, such an impact <laughs> across the nation, not only in our state, but it, it, it's a very powerful model and then bringing in the adults as well, so the, the, the whole family has that wraparound service. Okay, and Ginger, real quick, with what kind of relationship have you had with Neighborhood House to grow? Thank you, and I love that you brought up affordable housing, because I think affordable housing is directly linked to child care. And it's so interesting to me, because every, you know, we hear about inflation, constantly inflation, and the cost of, just the cost to live, just to, the cost to go to the grocery store is going up, so right now, we, if, uh, to have a household, you have to have two parent incomes. So somebody's got to watch our children. And I opened the paper, and it's housing, housing affordability, housing affordability, day over day. And it's, it's the topic du jour. And Governor Cox, who's dedicated a ton of time to 35,000 affordable homes, we don't see anything in, on the news about childcare affordability. It's, it just, it's not, there's not an awareness. So from the Salt Lake Chamber's perspective, we brought in a group of businesses to the neighborhood house to see what's going on here and to talk about how it's impacting our workforce. It was overwhelming. We had a standing room in your boardroom, Jennifer, of business leaders saying, I have workers leaving the workforce because they cannot afford childcare and something needs to be done and we've got to come together. Public-private partnerships, there needs to be something that is done. There needs to be solutions so that I don't have mothers coming into my office or their offices crying because they can't afford to have their children in, in childcare. Our family uh, just came a few months, a few months, and then uh, they don't have enough to um, 
to pay for a shelter. They knew about Neighbor House. They got the support. And uh, not just uh, uh, for the money, because you know we have the, uh, we have a parent concept. They can, they can have clothes. And at the end when they come to pick up the kids, we have how food they can take it to the house. It's already made. And you know we have all these many resources, met, mental resources for them. So yeah, we, you know, like we have uh, even uh, kids that they don't, um, they don't speak English. You know, they come over here and they are frustrated. But we have the support, we have those teachers that are like teaching them, you know. And uh, at the end, they're here, they're in kindergarten, and they're doing awesome things. And it's a uh, thank you to uh, all the donors, all the, you know, the money that they put in here at Neighbor House. So, yeah, we need more help. We need more support for these doors to be open because um, I think Neighbor House is making a huge difference outside. You know, I think uh, we are unique. We are a unique program. You know, we, uh, we care about our community, not just our teachers and our kids, our community, the community in general. Helping and sending them back out to be productive members yes. of the community. So I ask, yes. so how do we get you and your coworkers to invest in right. the neighborhood house and the community, right? How do, you, how do you prove that? How do you think that it's going in the future? It's, it's really sharing the message. Sharing the message and sharing the impact. Um, you know, we know right now the child care services were very uh, underfunded. They're working. What do you do? And that's where you see elder abuse and other things going on because they're spread so thin. And so continuing to, you know, share the story, spread the net, um, and have all of you, you know, share the story that someone doesn't know about Neighbor's House and we continue to um, spread our net. You know, there's some kids that they don't have their parents. So when they go over there, they're like, hey, my grandma, my grandpa's here. It's so exciting, you know, how even them, the adults, are so happy, you know, they're doing activities, they're dancing, they're playing, you know. So it's really impressive, you know, how uh, the impact that we do, like, with the kids and with the adults. I, I, I want to go back a little bit before I answer that to talk about the idea of sharing the message. I think um, we can we can say here, but um, I think what, what you just said about you know, the actual impact and watching and thinking, we have to tell that story. We have to create that narrative and really have people understand specific experiences that people are having. I think what, what Neighborhood House is doing here is really giving them purpose as well. That, that they can um, influence and be the caring adult for that child. And, and I think telling that story and seeing that this is creating a community that's powerful within this organization, and, and it gives people, that aging population, those older adults, um, a purpose to continue to, to contribute. And, and they have something left to contribute. We have our food pantry where all of the parents can take food at the end of the day and use that in their own kitchens. And then we also have a partnership with Salvation Army that which we're giving out hot, fully cooked meals to our families that are most in need at the end of every single day they're getting hot. The valuable thing that the clients say that they receive at Neighborhood House is the food program. So everything that Jennifer mentioned, and, um, as, and we hope you stay for the tour afterwards, but in the hallway, just outside this room, there's some fabulous black and white photos showing the history. And what you'll see is there is um, a woman feeding children crackers and milk, and making sure everyone's well fed. And so we've been providing meals for 130 years, and we plan to do it 130 more. Look at kind of what's right in front of our noses, but we've got to start looking um, for that, that upstream solution, and this is the upstream solution. If, if there's a child, and obviously the neighborhood has many children and many adults, but you think about the impact down the road if that child is fed, if that child is has connection and community, that child learns English. Um, and, you know, families as a whole are, are connecting and, and creating community. That down the road is going to mean they are going to be less of a burden on society. There, you know, if we're just talking numbers, let alone stories. Although I think stories are the most important, but if we're just talking about numbers, that is upstream, and we have to make sure that as a community we. We stop looking at just those those immediate um, barriers, and we look upstream and say, "This this is the kind of community we want to have."
this is the kind of state that we want to live in is where we have we have community, we have neighbors. And, and I just want to thank everyone on the panel so much for being here, for what you do in your in your day jobs and in the government positions that you hold.